to another Scots with a podcast. I'm joined once again by writer David Ross. Hello, David. How are you doing, Alison? Really good. And what's nice about this one is we're in the same room. It's we're been in, a while. We're, we're in the same room and we're in your kitchen, <laughs> which is great. And we're going to talk about uh, your most recent novel, Dashboard Elvis is Dead. I'm sure we'll talk about much more when we can rent it. Okay. But what can you tell listeners about the book? Um, well, oh, that's that's a, um, a direct question for which there's no real direct answer, as you can probably expect from me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's on 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 the surface, it, it's a fairly straightforward telling of a life, you know, uh, over a course of forty years or so. Uh, an American uh, photojournalist called Jude, ostensibly looking back on the forty years of her life and how she's got to where she is. And when the book starts, she's um, not in America anymore. She's over in Scotland, um, following the the people who are involved in the two thousand and fourteen independence referendum, with whom she has some history. Yeah. Um, and and the book is really um, and uh, the the telling of that history, if you know what I mean. Sometimes from different perspectives, um, and you know, putting that all together at the end. Um, and it has I suppose it has it kind of has this back uh, background idea that you know the the truth of any situation is only really in in the telling of it you mm-hmm. know and, and people will tell it differently and you know I I, I became kind of fascinated by that really you know the the whole idea about truth and perception and and I suppose to 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 come to bring that right round, what's what's the book really about? As opposed to you know what's its surface mm-hmm. level, um, I was really fascinated by the decline of America, you know, over right. this period of of time. Uh, it, it's definitely a post-Trump book, mm-hmm. even though the the timeline doesn't include that. But I, th- I think that whole question about how um, how can you kind of get to the to the truth of any situation is a real prevalent issue nowadays, you know. Um, so that, that that that's kind of what it's trying to examine the the the, the how to get to the truth of a a, a series of situations that are quite uh, unusual um, and and the the connections that certain people make and how they remember that part of the story, you know. Because they always used to say that history was written by the winners. But I think what's interesting now, it will get so many ways of uh, collecting, whether it's audio footage or video or all that stuff, and she's a photojournalist. Yeah. You can get, in inverted commas, proof, or at least proof that what that person says has validity. Yeah, I mean, that, the, whole, the whole question, you know, after Trump about, you know, what can you actually trust when you're... From sources that you would previously never have thought to question, you yeah. know. Um, whether it's uh, traditional news outlets or even whether it's photographic journals, all that, I mean, all of that is now in the hands of people who can, uh, you know, manipulate it for their own ends. You know, it's, it's a really interesting, uh, it's a really interesting angle on history. Yeah. You know, um, so I, the, the the book also navigates its way through real points of history that. Um, I, I guess are to some extent chosen because they're open to interpretation or yeah. they're open to misinterpretation depending on how you would want to look at that, you know? Yeah, and in particular in America, and of course it's happening everywhere and it has been, but these events are often used for political yeah. gain or personal gain. Absolutely, absolutely. And why did you want to set it in America? Was it for that reason? Was that reason being how did we get to Trump? Yeah, I, I I think like most people, I would imagine, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated and horrified by America in equal measure. Do you know, mm-hmm. it, it, there's there's a real kind of um, love hate relationship that I, I don't think will ever change. And and from most of the people that I I speak to, um, who love the music, love the culture, love the arts, hate the political aspects of and, and some of the human rights issues, you know. Um, you, you're weighing those things in the balance all the time when you consider what America maybe means and what it means what it means to you personally, you know. And I, I, I was always really interested in trying to tackle that as a subject, mm-hmm. but it's vast, you know. It, it's where do you start? Where do you, you know, where do you set the parameters for something like that? So it ended up being um, a, a vast plane of context to work with. 
but restricted to two or three, uh, quite a small cast of characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's people coming in and out, but fundamentally, it's about um, Jude and Jamie, mm-hmm. and they they come they come with an understanding of America from two completely different perspectives. So it gives you that opportunity to maybe try and figure out what those those contentious issues really meant to me. You know, yeah. Uh, I don't know that I'm any. I don't know that I feel any diff any more. <laughs> Differently about it now, having written the book, <clears throat> um, I, I, I mean, I still um, attracted like a magnet to America and American culture, um, but increasingly horrified by some of the things they put their people through. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at some of the the places that had had natural disasters and how it seems to me a lot of them were just left. Yeah. As well. Yeah, yeah. you're right. You yeah. know, it, it's it's uh, quite horrific. But like you, it's shaped American culture has absolutely shaped me, yeah. particularly as a young guy. You know, yeah. when it was yeah. the kind of iconography of Elvis and uh, James Dean and Marilyn Monroe and yeah. all these things yeah. were huge. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the Elvis, the Elvis figure really yeah. is kind of a metaphor for that. To be honest, I mean, over the timeline of the. the 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 period um, you know you, you've you've got Elvis as a really young vibrant um, beautiful person you know uh, right at the point where being a teenager is beginning to mean something completely different than yeah. what it had previously and then you know whether whether through um, corruption or paranoia or a whole series of other influences on his life he then becomes a bit fat and bloated and perhaps a wee bit irrelevant, you know. Um and I, I think you know, as as a as a kind of metaphor for America over that period of time, it's quite a it's quite an interesting one. You know? Yeah. The cars got bigger and he got bigger and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just that complete um loss of reality and being grounded and everything else, you know. And you mentioned the the characters, I mean there's quite a Fantastic cast are all who are all connected, as you say. I wonder, without giving anything away, we could maybe talk through the kind of central ones. Because you've got Anna Mason. So, yeah. what's her role in the events? Um, well, Anna, Anna Mason is uh, a, a background peripheral character at the beginning of the book, mm-hmm. and really um, someone who is um, the connection between Jamie and Brian Mason. You know the the guys who started the band at the very beginning. Anna's Anna's Brian's um, sister, elder sister, um, and she has a relationship with Jamie that he be, starts to feel is stifling him. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also the route to um, Brian's father's money that's kind of supporting them a bit at the, at the early stage. So he he, be, he begins to resent her mm-hmm. for a whole host of reasons. Um, and she's apparently unaware of that, you know. Um, and eventually, as it turns around, Anna is the business head of it all and, and sees an opportunity with the band and, and their, their music and other people's music through the PRS. So she, she becomes more involved in that. Um, and when, the, when their record gets selected by an American ad agency... She's the one who's registered as their financial manager. So the next part of the story effectively comes into well, you know, the the the, the band's falling apart. Um, but this one record that they've made that mm. means so much to Jude Montgomery as well, and she's kind of instrumental in it becoming part of this uh, this advertising strategy. It's Anna that puts all that together, mm-hmm. and is is someone who is you know sees an opportunity to try and repair a lot of what's happened in the background. Uh, but she's also got a political um, angle, you know, and has grown up because of the connections that she's made through through that route um, to have a political position. And um, she finds herself, after the 2014 uh, referendum, as the First Minister, you know. So um, it, it, there, there is an allusion, obviously, to the fact that Scotland had a female First Minister mm. and how the referendum may have turned out to be an advantage for her, even though it was lost because that position put her in that spotlight. Mm-hmm. Whether it would have had had the decision been different, I'm you know who knows. Um, 
And and there are you know I I, I like the idea uh, you know sometimes you surf close to the wind here or sail close to the wind in terms of involving real yeah. characters and real situations in the book. Um, you know I, I I hope it's not seen too much as uh, any individual who isn't named in the book mm. specifically as feeling well that's obviously you know that yeah. individual or whatever. But I I kind of guess that because of the way you know, the animation character resigns public, <laughs> publicly. Um, you know, people might put two and two together and, and say, well, you know, clearly it's it's based on Nicola Sturgeon. Um, but I have to point out, animation resigned her position far earlier yes. than Nicola Sturgeon did. <laughs> I have read the book. I didn't see that coming. I could... I, <laughs> I, it never struck me. Oh, of course you get the, the kind of... Uh, Parallels, but it never struck me because of the backstory, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and and she seems like her own person. And all there are lots of kind of links between the characters that go through. But what is good to me is that you don't, you know, unload them straight up. You know, you've got to work your way through the book to find out exactly yeah. what they were. And that goes for, as you said, Jamie Hewitt and the hype tones, which is the band, and how you know it's. There's connections that happen that could be, well, they are um, just happenstance, aren't they? That people had to be in the right places and just happened to, you know, meet over one night. And that idea of making a connection over a short period of time, I think, is a really strong one. Yeah, as well. and I, that's the thing that really fascinates me. And it's, it's, it has happened to me a few times in life, you know. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work in a whole load of different countries and quite diverse backgrounds. And, you know, there's there's been four or five times in the most unlikely sentence that you would ever imagine that I've bumped into people who know me or know someone related to me, you know. Um, and I find, I, there's, there's bits of that that I find quite mind-blowing, you know. Yeah. The amount of people in the world and, you know, there's, there's a circumstance under which, you, you know, you, you, you encounter someone who, with whom you've either got history yeah. or it, it takes you in a slightly different direction. Whether it's to do with work or whether it's to do, you know, just that opportunistic mm-hmm. chance meeting with someone, I'm constantly fascinated by that. And of course, Twitter now uh, takes sometimes takes that into a, a, a slightly different environment where you you know you communicate with a lot of people on Twitter that you don't really know, yeah. but you know you've got shared interests, whether it's music or books or culture or whatever. Yeah. And then the realization that um, you know thirty years after it happened. You, you might have been at an event and that person was in the audience mm-hmm. and it's not like, you know, there, there were 70,000 no. of you. It's tiny wee gigs with a handful of people, yeah. do you know? Um, that, that just blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, I remember going to see uh, Curiosity Killed the Cat in the Battlelands and there must have been about 30 folk in the audience and I've met two other people <laughs> that were at that same gig, which is some I, odd. I just, I find that... You know, really, really interesting. You know, and so you know the the idea that um, you know time or or I don't want to say fate or destiny mm-hmm. or whatever, but you know circumstances bring people together, and even for the briefest of of moments, something might happen that changes the direction of people's lives. I, I there's there's always something really interesting to me about that, and literature is a good way of trying to explore. Yeah, I, I think where that direction might go. You know. And with the hype tones, did you have an idea of the kind of band that they, they were, you know, in terms of how big they got and all that kind of thing? Was it always going to be the one song that was central? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I, the, the, the idea that they've got something um, rather than a career, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's that one-time thing and, you know, the way the band breaks up and the way that, you know, they, they, they'll fall out with each other. I think... If if you had, uh, if if they'd had two or three albums and they were quite successful, then the story might not have had the same resonance because mm-hmm. you would imagine well one guy falls out and the rest of them go and form another band and yeah. stuff. But I think because it was one, it's it's one song. Um, you know, and it, there's a bit where they're sitting in their kitchen and Live Aid's on and they're, you know, all um, debating whether it could have been them rather yeah. than Nick Kershaw. You know. I really like that idea, you know, and I think if if you if there's a more established uh, backstory, then maybe that doesn't quite have this this the same strength of of story 
uh, one big hit single and then it falls apart right at that point and there's the what could have been and yeah. you know uh, yeah so I, I think the, the the band are really a vehicle to, to basically just try and understand Jamie what Jamie Hewitt feels that he's lost or or, or you know the guilt that he's got associated with how he got to that position yeah. do you know yeah and there's also latterly the character of Rabbit yeah and again you don't want to give anything away but she's a great character yeah yeah um, there the was a bit of life in, in that character and I, I I imagine that if I was ever to come back to that she might be the focus of it if you know yeah. what I mean yeah um, I, I think uh, the there's, there's a wee bit in the back of the book where I, I'm quite happy to list influences and mm. ideas and stuff like that. And I, I remember, I've never forgotten being blown away by Jenny Savile's paintings at the Glasgow School of Art. She graduated the same year I did, so the end of year shows. I saw that show, uh, video, uh, that's one of the things. That so, you, you know, I never exactly, forgotten yeah. it. Um, it was astonishing. Um, so, you know, the, the, the kind of work... Uh, and the kind of art that Jenny does was really in the back of my mind here about figurative work and mm-hmm. you know um, the, the 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 story that leads up to how that's the kind of artist she is I think was really mm-hmm. interesting um, albeit I, I never really had the feeling that, that she was going to be such a central character in, in the story and she doesn't really appeal that often in it but, no. but you know, you she's, the mo- she's the motivation for a lot of what she yeah. does you know and do your characters surprise you like that sometimes? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, th- I think the that the, the I, I think we've spoken about this before. That I, th- I think the first four books that I did were really quite heavily plotted. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. um, I, I, I probably didn't feel confident enough in my own ability to just start writing and see where it led. You know, um, but. This one and and Danny Garvey before it were definitely like that. You know, I had the loose idea of where I thought it might lead, um, but it start it starts to change direction when you've got a character that you think is a wee bit more interesting. So um, one of the characters that I quite like myself is is Jude's flatmate Hennessy, mm-hmm. um, and I kind of thought you know he he in in an, an original bit of the story. He only really appeared for two or three pages, yeah. You know, and then was was ma- mainly just a vehicle for her to find somewhere to stay until she got on her feet and then moved away. Um, but there was something about that relationship that I thought was really interesting, mm-hmm. and you know, a, a, as a mechanism to maybe try and explore um, the gentrification of New York and the clearances and what it was doing to people who were being pushed out. Um, homeless people primarily mm-hmm. you know that that was an opportunity to maybe reconsider that but even then I mean I, I like that character so much that I thought you know he, he, there has to be something heroic about him in, in the way yeah. his story pans out and it needs to mean something to Jude obviously and is um, that more exciting as a writer that kind yeah, of I think you know so. having a let's see <clears throat> where this story goes I, I, I think so I mean it, it it's kind of Exciting and a wee bit scary at yeah, the same time, imagine, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I really like that now. You mm-hmm. know, I, I think um, I don't know that I would go back to that whole kind of plotting, and I'm not going to start writing here until I know exactly what's going to happen, yeah. and where they're all going, and you know, um, that, that it's more interesting this way. I think, but I, I do, I do think you have to develop the confidence and. Uh, and and your ability to take that story on, so you know you, you need you need to serve time on the. And <laughs> don't get me wrong, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not rubbishing the early books because I still. No. I'm really fond of it. Yeah, absolutely. But they're written in a different style, and I can tell that now. You know. Because well, I was going to say to you, I think this uh, Dash Bodels is dead is your best book so oh, far. Thank you. But I mean, I said the same thing about Danny McGarvey. <laughs> That's Before, good. But what I was going to ask you then, do you think? Are you just changing as a writer rather than improving, or is it both? Um, I, I I think I suppose that's difficult for me to answer, but I I think uh, both. I I think it's imp- the, the work's improving. If you know, what I mean, I don't. Mm. I mean, I don't routinely go back and read old stuff that I've written. Mm. 
and the only reason I would do that now is I've got a really terrible memory, you know, and I, I, sometimes you, you think of ideas and storylines, and I think that's something about that that have I written that before? Ah, you know? yeah, I guess. And yeah, yeah. you you sometimes have to go back and do a quick check, you know. Um, but I I think the I think I think the quality of the writing's oh, excuse me <clears throat> I think the quality of the writing um, has improved with every book if you mm, know what I mean yeah uh, and I, I I don't know if that's I don't know if that's necessarily the way everybody's writing career develops I'm not sure um, and I don't know what, I don't know what the reason for it is mm. you know I'm probably reading more mm-hmm. than I did before. Um, and just absorbing more ideas and influences and things like that. You know, I never really did that at the, at the first mm-hmm. one. And it's a bit, you know, the first book I did, probably like most people's, is, is a bit more autobiographical anyway. Um, but this was a stretch, I have to say. You know, it, it took longer than the other books. Um, I don't really like the idea of researching, you know, to... to to, to the point where you're worried it becomes an academic yeah, thesis yeah, and who wants to read that, you know. Um, but I, I did feel like I, I was learning a wee bit about my own cap- capabilities with this, you know. And also the plot kind of unfolds over time as well as place. Yeah. And was that difficult to keep track of? Um, not, not, uh, not as much. I, I, I think the, you know, the, the plotting and the pacing, the one thing I was aware of is when you're doing it like that and you're writing in a first person perspective um, you know and, and all of a sudden there's there's a period that might be six months which is taken up by the first part of the book mm-hmm. and then there's another period which you know goes longer and you're starting to think right, okay that, that there was a pace to that but um, what happens in the bits between the punctuation marks of trying to cover 30 years, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to get to a point where the reader's going to think, well, OK, that, you've, you've, you've covered that period, but what's happening in between, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the, that was quite difficult, you know, to try and make it feel like, you know, the, the reader's not thinking, well, there's three years have passed and not much has happened, yeah. and, you know, I, I want to know about that. Um, but I think, I think there was more in this to start with, and, I, right. you know, Working with an editor and um, did you see I, more in it? it? There was it was longer. Aye, that there was there was simply because I was worried about that, yeah. you know. Um, and I think where my editor definitely helped was to try and strip that back and you know focus on the things that are actually propelling the story rather than feeling like you're having to fill in for the reader things that they're probably not going to yeah. worry about, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was that. That was an interesting process when you're looking at forty years, really. And is it an enjoyable process to edit them and for you? Um, yeah, I, 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 you think you have to trust. Yeah, your yeah, editor. Yeah. I've got a great editor, you know, like um, West Camel f- from Arenda has edited every one of my books, um, and you know, it, it, it's it wouldn't be this. None of these books would be the same without um, yeah. without that input. Um, it's a team thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people don't realise, and why should they, because you, know, you want to enjoy the book, but that um, team, as you say, the whole team thing is really important, and levels of trust as well, because I've been on the other side editing books, and sometimes you'll offer suggestions that initially are like, oh, no, no, that's I'm yeah. not realising that. But then eventually, oh, sometimes there's a... Compromise is the wrong word, but there's a solution in there that comes between that conversation. Aye, aye. I mean, I... I <clears throat> I, I approached this at the start. First of all, we got on pretty well. We got on really well, um, and um, you know, I think on that basis, I I know that when there's suggestions being made, and maybe this doesn't work quite as well, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it's always right. I mean, I don't find that infuriating at all. But you know, I, I, I but you then the more you the more you're in that mindset, you start to think a wee bit more like that when you're writing. Yeah. You know, and so when you mentioned when you asked the question earlier on, am I am I developing as a writer? Then I think it's because I've absorbed all these influences from people yeah. like West and and Calm as well. So you so you kind of know how to shape the story in a way that is going to be a reader's going to yeah. be looking for it. If you know what I mean? Yeah. I, what I've often found is that sometimes <clears throat> the suggestion is something that the writers already 
talk about it in some way themselves and they go, well, this has just proved that I was maybe right. And it might be right. a whole load of research that has been done and you think, yeah. oh, I really don't yeah. want to lose that because I've put so much into it. But yeah. you actually, it doesn't help the story. It, it doesn't on. help, no. Um, well, let's go back a bit to the, the, the kind of cultural influence because a uh, it's it is something you know you said at the back you've got um your influences and you name things like new york by lou reed the record fantastic album paul oster's new york trilogy the wizard of oz yeah. on the road um but you've also got things like great expectations uh rake's progress ex Beth by david keenan scabby queen uh, yeah. as well by yeah. kirsten innes and you mentioned Jenny Savile and also uh, Lucien Freud, another favourite painter of mine. Again, it's that sense of scale, isn't yeah, it? And the, yeah. the thing. Why are these the inspirations? Can you say that? Or is it just a kind of, here's the things that I was thinking about as I wrote this book? Um, I, I think probably, you know, the, the Scabby Queen and Extra Beth are were pretty close to um, the timeline of starting <clears> to think about this, you know. Um, and both in different ways had made me think a wee bit differently about how how this story might develop. Right. You know? um, the um, trying to be a wee bit more um, experimental with the structure and you know the, how the punctuation works. Um, the idea through Scabby Queen of um, a story being told from a number of different perspectives that you then, you know, the reader to some extent has to try and work out where that truth is coming from. I thought yeah. it was really interesting. And, I, you know, that if, if that's that's kind of, apart from the fact that the writing's fantastic, you know, that's sort of the influence yeah. from from uh, Kirsten. Um, the other things really are, are just things that I, I, I were in the back of my mind, really, um, about... A, a, a story that is kind of based on a journey, you know, yeah. um, realizing that some idea of that journey can be a wee bit lame. But when you look at all these different things, they're, they're kind of representative of different of, of stories that are operating on a different mm -hmm. level. If you know what I mean, um, the Wizard of the Oz thing was was quite interesting. And there's you know there's a few things that are in the text that are still sort of suggestions to that. But it's almost like the Wizard of Oz in the way that David Lynch might yeah. take that as an influence, maybe for Wilder Heart or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. Yeah. Um it, it's there in the background, but it's it's a more malign sort of yeah. route and story and journey through someone's life, you know. Um that yeah, I mean that they they um they were all kind of there and in, in New York is is probably about the city at a time when it was changing from one state to the next. Yeah. And not everybody from New York was happy about that. Mm -hmm. You know, feel there's a feeling that it was losing its soul and, and that, you know, it was it was really interesting to get back into under the lyrics of all that mm -hmm. and, and really understand um the city from a musical perspective, you know. Um so yeah, I mean I I and and I I kind of owed them the acknowledgement, you know. Yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting thing to do. Uh, and you've also got music, like where you always have a kind of soundtrack yeah. along to it. And that's the way I think about it. Is that the way you intend it to be a kind of soundtrack to the book? Or Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned before that I think, and maybe this is just, a, you know, what, what's important for me in reading a book, that I always feel that a story or a book's got to have a sound, mm -hmm. you know. And if it doesn't have a sound that, you know, that's recognisable for me, it, it doesn't really have a soul either. You right. know? Um, so th th there'll, there'll be, you know, one particular song or one particular vibe of a song that represents the book more than anything else. So Danny Garvey, it was Joy Division's Isolation, you know, so yeah. there, there should be something of the what that song evokes all the way through the the book, you know, about unsettling mm -hmm. and you know, un uncertain of relationships and a bit threatening and claustrophobic mm -hmm. and, you know, qu quite quite a cold feel to, to yeah. the book, you know. With this one, it was probably um, Simon and Garfunkel's America. You know? Yeah. That, that kind of feeling of it's all out there for yeah, you and just uh, don't get it. And then when you start to go, maybe it's not what you thought it was going to yeah. be. The so, kind yeah. of expanse and the possibilities. that I think yeah. of that song in particular... 
you know, yeah, there's things in the background, but this idea of you know no, what America no, has no. to offer, and whether it's the, the truth or not. No, back no, to your no, idea no. of what's the what's the truth or not, and talk a little bit about the Scottish Strand. I and mean, you mentioned it; it's just after. Uh, well, you've got it's not just that time. There are other periods as well, going mm-hmm. back into the histories of Jamie and uh, and everyone. Um, was, was it important to have that Scottish Strand as well? I, I think so. Um, you know, I, I, I think from me personally, yeah, you know, because it, it, it gives it gives Jude a wee bit of a feeling that, you know, from an identity point of view, she's not, um, not as comfortable maybe with that American identity or American background that has kind of gravitated a wee bit more to her father's side. Her father yeah. was born in Scotland and he's got Scottish heritage and, you know, um, I, I mean, it's her, the, the book at the beginning is really her trying to search for some mm-hmm. kind of connection to an identity that she wants to have as opposed to the one that she probably thinks that she has. So she she's trying to gravitate to something that's a bit more, maybe a bit more international. Whether that's to do with the the lack of that parental structure growing up, um, the the lack of knowledge about who her father was and, and therefore who she might be as well, uh, and also that growing frustration with what America represents uh, and the school um, the school shooting at the beginning of the, the, the book is kind of the catalyst for that. That's not the America she wants to yeah. be part of or wants to feel like you know she's she belongs to so it's it's a kind of journey in a search to try and determine something that she can hold on to that isn't American you know mm-hmm. and I mean I meant to ask you about Jude when we were talking about the characters because she for me obviously she's the central character but she's an unforgettable character you know and I still want to know what else has happened yeah. to Jude you know she really stays with you did she stay with you as a writer I think so, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, when I started to approach this, um, I thought that that was going to be a real challenge for me, to be honest. You know, like, um, every, every, all of the books that I've written so far, are, are it, it could be argued, are fairly, uh, fairly well set in a male perspective that is quite close to mm-hmm. something I understand or, yeah. or at least I've had some connection with before. You know, so that back to your point earlier on about trying to grow as a writer and trying mm-hmm. to develop um, a different way of writing you know that there's, there's nothing going to be further from my experience than uh, a, a young mixed race girl growing up in America in the in the 80s mm-hmm. you know yeah. um, so that I thought right that's that's where I want to base this story but I, I was completely aware of the 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 difficulties that mm-hmm. I, was, I was going to face with that, to be honest. But the one thing that I, has always kind of stayed with me and given me a wee bit of comment, I started to submit the first drafts and the early drafts. Um, West Camel, my editor, had highlighted that um, that was the most authentic part of the book for him. You yeah. know? So her story, in fact, and I'm giving away anything here, but David F. Ross as a writer appears in the book mm-hmm. as well. And... <laughs> said to me that uh, the only bit that doesn't ring true is the David F. Ross part. I thought, hang on a minute, that's, that's, you know, um, that's an interesting perspective that I can get the, the voice of a, um, a, young, uh, a young girl uh, in a different country with a completely different experience to mine. Yeah. So right, and David F. Ross is not a million miles from, well, from me, of, you know. Well, along those lines, you know, I was thinking back to the book because it's a wee while since I'd, I'd read it. I kind of forgotten you were in it <laughs> as well, and then it was just I went, oh, I've written down David F. Ross is in this book. Yes, yes. Uh, so that's kind of maybe echoing uh, uh, that, that idea. I mean, you're not in it for very often. It's not. It's, no, you know, it's um, a. It's a and it, you know, I, 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 I don't. I genuinely don't want to give away the ending. No, no, I think, no. Yeah. I think I'm actually quite good at endings. Yeah. And it, oh no, don't do that. Absolutely. Persevering with it, um, but that you know that was how that came about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, there's. And I did actually think that you could have a wee bit of a wee bit of fun with the idea that you know there's a writer in this called David F. Ross, yeah. and um, you know he's he's um, central to some of the events and how it works together. And, uh, 
so I, I, I that that aspect was in the book from the very beginning. Yeah. You know, uh, he he was going to be the device that yeah, kind of tried yeah. to. to I think it what's interesting about that, and also what's interesting about the Scottish side of things, is that for a regular reader of yours, and I don't know whether you meant this or not, it's kind of like. Oh yeah, this is a David uh, Frost book. I don't mean by putting yeah. yourself yeah. in it, just having no, that no. kind of touchstones of, of yeah. And then yeah. I, th- I wonder if you've gone straight to America, if you like, uh-huh. and just done a big American novel for it. It might have threw, thrown a lot of uh, yeah. I, I think so. They're, they're, I, I I quite like the idea that there's connections between the books as well. You know, so they they are hidden. You know, they're they're not. Um, but just even if it, even if someone raises an eyebrow at the yeah. fact that Max Mojo gets mentioned in one line in this, yes. I like that. Yeah. You know? um, and you know maybe maybe book, the books in that consciousness they all do have a life and, and a, a connection with each mm-hmm. other. You know I, I quite like to think of them all existing in a period of time and the people that are in it are you know they're, they're in a fictional world. But they're all in that fictional world, if you know what I mean. Do you know what you mean? I just think how much, how that big that fictional world is going to be, and you end up, you know, as they're blurring the lines between that world and then well, the, 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 I, I suppose the ultimate blur of the, the book's called Dashboard the Elvis mm. is Dead by David F. Ross. Yeah. And the book in the context of the fiction is called Dashboard yeah. the Elvis is Dead by David F. Ross. You know, so. Yeah. I, I, it is effectively a, a physical manifestation of the fictional book that's in the book, if you know what I mean. That yes. Doesn't, that doesn't tie too many people in therapeutic <laughs> notes. <laughs> but it takes me back to Jude as a character herself, so you can uh, still think about her even though the book is out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I, it took a wee while to... When I'd finished this, it mm. took a wee while to actually contemplate doing anything else yeah you know it's uh, interesting I was I had a, I did a podcast with Leila Abalela about her new novel River Spirits and she said exactly the same thing there was a couple of characters in particular that she kind of almost grieved for when she wasn't writing them aye, anymore you know because they'd been so close aye, aye. You, you do spend uh, you do spend an, an awful lot of time with them over a an 18 month two year period you know mm-hmm. uh, and it's only you you know what I mean yeah. it's, it's very difficult to yeah, nobody involve else has met your them. family yeah. or involve your pals and uh-huh. stuff that you're, doesn't make any sense to anybody yeah. until, you've, until they've actually read it so it's all going on in your environment and these, these um, you, you know you're working hard to try and make these people as real as, but and authentic as possible that you, I, can, I do understand how you know writers can sit on the verge of madness at <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that again strengthens your relationship with your editor because they'll probably Aye. be the first people to enter that world and get to yeah, meet these people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, what's uh, next for yourself, David? Can you tell us? There have been whispers, I think, of ad- adaptations or you know. I, well, like that. I, I I did a wee bit of for short attention span um, theatre. I did a wee ten minute thing uh, on an element of Danny Garvey that I was interested in um, and I, I'm kind of quite keen to try and do something from a stage point of view with that, a couple of conversations with, with people um, to see how that can develop but I wanted to see how the 10-15 minute excerpt right. thing would work um, because the I, you know, there's an element of how do you get across that Danny's actually having a conversation with the audience, but also in the moment at the same time, mm-hmm. and that you know I, I get that that's sometimes quite a difficult thing to carry off, you know, um, and it and it's quite it, it's an involving story, obviously Danny Garvey, and and it changes from beginning to end, yeah. where you know you kind of maybe trust them more at the beginning than you do at the end of it, um, but also you know I I had always wanted to start looking at a sequel to that right. book um, and maybe not right now but I'm, I'm kind of thinking a wee bit about that in a minute um, but the thing that I've kind of just started doing is um, a book that's hopefully something that might come out next year called Weekenders right. and the the idea behind that is it's, 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 try, it's trying to do something slightly different again you know back into Glasgow focusing on um, a, a central individual who's telling the story and really 
a, a really good man, you know, right. um, lonely but good, involved with religion and tries to do the right thing all the time. And like Job is being tested right. and tested and tested. And the idea is to try and see how far he can be pushed to still believe that he's doing something that's good, but actually it's more and more evil as he as he goes on. So the weekenders in it are uh, a, a group of people who live a high life in Glasgow and go out to um, these kind of psychedelic parties right. uh, outside the city of a weekend. Okay. And how this character gets involved with them as he's a sketch artist for the police. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of them's had their house broken in when they're away at the weekend. And the description that he's been given to draw can only be his younger brother, right. with whom he's got a difficult relationship. So as 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 his God has forsaken him, mm-hmm. you know, he's starting to believe that if God can't save his brother, maybe he can. And by trying to trying to save him from this fate, he gets drawn into the, the world of the weekenders. So Oh brilliant. And is it set in the kind of nineties that all kind no, of weekend? No, no, um it, it's kinda at the moment sixty eight, nineteen sixty eight, nineteen sixty nine. Okay. So Wow. Uh, I was I I was kind of, I don't really know why actually, um, but I just, I kind of thought um, the, this, there was an element of uh, part of his, uh, why is God giving him such a hard time at the minute? And it's just in the, in the backdrop of the Bible John thing in Scotland where anyone who's out, uh, yeah. you know, talking about Jesus saves and, and Buchanan Street and trying to, yeah, trying yeah. to is maybe becoming a bit of a target. <laughs> and that's interesting because it's a period in Glasgow, that's, apart with a few obvious exceptions, uh, hasn't been written about that much. You know, it was a real period yeah. of change. You know, uh, um, I was watching the Bible John documentary that was on the telly, and as you say, 69, and I was born in 70. And uh, the, it just looks like a different time to when I remember, you know, yeah. even in the, yeah. going into the 70s and then of course the 80s, it's it's, I, I, it's I, I've got memories of that time uh, we uh, we, moved, well, yeah. we moved away from Glasgow in uh, right. the mid 70s but um, I lived in uh, Parkhead originally but then Mount Florida mm-hmm. just not far from here um, up to uh, 72, 73 and there's, there's a whole lot of things that are now coming back to me about living in a tenement flat and yeah. living, and I, I thought it's quite interesting time, you know, um, and vibe and the the it's, it's an interesting thing to maybe look at and consider um, without having to you know be concerned about too heavily yeah. about the developing forensics and stuff. Like yeah, that. sure. You know, you can get away with a wee bit more. I think if if there's if there's that period of time when police technology wasn't as advanced as as it became in the in the seventies and eighties, do you know? And is there a song at the heart of this one? <laughs> uh, not at the moment. Um, You've got some great moment. ones to choose the, from. The one that the one that I the, the one that I uh, um, the one that sticks in my mind, and and it's mainly because my dad played it all the time. Uh, round about that was Glenn Campbell's uh, Got a Half Tenderness yeah. which is on an album Galveston yeah. um, so there's there's that kind of kicking around so it's, it's kind of got that sort of um, country and western type vibe <laughs> which goes back to the influence of Scot- our American culture on Scotland I mean you know it's been going on for decades yeah, and decades yeah. and that whole country and western scene which you still have you know but you can yeah. still see today in the city and outside or ever surround the city is a strong Aye. I mean you've asked me this before and I've said to you before as well that starting to think about a book you know even though I'm, even though there's no specific plot and it's, it's basically here's a guy who's uh, you know devoted his entire life to religion uh, to the point where he's got no real relationships it's basically and all of a sudden you know that that is He's having to question that, you know. Um, that's the starting point of it all. But if you're just immersing myself at the moment in 
the late sixties in Glasgow with the you know music that was mm. around, not not simply American music, but other things. And you start and you start to get a picture of it. You know what I mean? You yeah. start to you, you start to think differently, and, and it, I, that's the importance of the music for me, to be honest. Yeah. Um, that you have to be back in that in, in that kind of mindset, even though I you know my memories of that are are more limited than it would have been if they were in the mid eighties or yeah. something. Like that. I've still got I've still got fairly fixed memories of um, men and and uh, my dad and his pals and you know the way they spoke to each other and the way they kind of um, what they did when they were in ten, moving from tenement flat to tenement flat. You know. And you've got another set of characters then to yeah. live in this literary world yeah. that you've got with everyone yeah, absolutely, else. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait for that. That sounds brilliant. David, thanks so much for taking no the problem. time to come over and no have problem. a chat with me. It's been no, great to see you. I, and, and you. Um, it's, it's always great to chat and as, as I'm, I'm hugely appreciative of the support that you, you always give, not only me, but um, everybody else is in literature in Scotland. It's, it's really, um, it's really, I'm really grateful for it on, on on everybody's behalf oh thank you very much I do appreciate that and we'll be back soon with someone completely different cheers cheers